Good morning, my friends. Good morning. It's Matthew Street, and welcome to my channel. As always, so happy you're here. And folks, wow, my millennial and my Gen Z came through for me again, folks, because here we are, sooner than I thought, for episode two of my new series, Paul McCartney, The Truth. Folks, you know this series. If you saw episode one, I encourage you to go back and see it, where we did Egypt Station. But basically what I'm doing, folks, is I give my little take on Paul McCartney albums that have come out through the decades. Could be his early stuff in the 70s, mid-level, 80s, 90s, all the way up to today. And basically I reassess them again. Because it's hard for us as Paul fanatics, Beatle fanatics, to be totally unbiased and unprejudiced towards Paul. Obviously, I love Paul, as I told you in the first video, and I'm not going to belabor the point here. I'm a fan, so he can pretty much release anything, and I'm going to find that silver lining to what Paul releases, because I'm a fanatic. So I wanted to get some kind of neutral people involved, younger people, millennials, Gen Z, maybe Gen X here or there. We'll see who I can get going forward. But I wanted to just get their neutral, totally unbiased take on a Paul McCartney album. What do you think of this album? We did Egypt Station. And as I said, it wasn't meant to slam Paul or anything because I love Paul. And Egypt Station for me is on, the, you know, it, it's probably a, a C plus B minus album for me. I kind of like Egypt Station. I wish it would it would have been better with some of the Explorers edition songs on it, but whatever, it is what it is. I kind of liked it. But my Gen Z and my Millennial, they weren't too keen on Egypt Station. So I thought I'd pick another album from another era of Paul's for episode two. And they came through for me. They really seemed to be into this series. And they said going forward, they will try to help me do more of these episodes. So let's go. The album today is, as I slide it into view, is Press to Play. All right. The great Press to Play from 1986. Now, this album came out August 25th of 1986. It was produced by Hugh Padgham. Uh, I think Paul, after what happened in 83 with Pipes of Peace, and then he kind of got slammed a little bit, forgive my regards, for Broad Street in 84. You know, he was kind of coming off that, wanting to maybe modernize his sound, be more updated today for that time, 1986. So he got Hugh involved for producing this. And this was his first release back on EMI after six years on the Columbia label. Remember, he did that big multi-million dollar deal with Columbia in the late 70s. Well, he was finally out of that contract, back with EMI. Sadly, the album didn't do as great as other Paul albums have done. It only made number eight in the UK, although it did go gold in the UK. And in the United States at the time, it only made number 30, which was pretty low for Paul. Uh, I don't know if it's achieved any status as far as gold or anything beyond that since then. I didn't check that. You can tell me. But, you know, it didn't do that well. So I'm sure it, w it was painful for Paul to put all his heart into a modernized sounding album for the mid 80s and come out only number 30 in the U.S. and only number eight in the U.K., you know, it probably disappointed him a little bit. He did have the great single off it called Press, which made top 40 here in the United States. I'm not sure how it did in the rest of the world, but it was a great catchy single. But again, it only made like uh, the bottom half of the top 40. It didn't really, wasn't a smash hit or anything. Although the video for it, where he's on the English or UK subway system in London, he it, th that was fantastic. The video he did for press was second to none. It's a great, uh, very original idea for a video. Now, the cover photograph, I always liked the cover. It was very striking, and it was done by the famous Hollywood photographer from back in the 30s and 40s. His name was George Harrell, George Harrell or Harrell, and he used his old original box camera from the 30s and 40s to take these images, and basically he did a lot of the Hollywood stars back in the day, and this was kind of a, a homage to those old Hollywood days with the George Harrell taking the picture. And I've seen numerous pictures from these sessions and they're great pictures of Paul and Linda. Absolutely fantastic. So I love the cover. However, the problem with me with the cover is it, it's a nice cover. I like it. It's striking, but it has nothing to do and does not fit any of the music contained therein in this album. Okay. This cover, I think would have sat great on Kisses on the Bottom. 
if Paul had taken something like this, like years later when he did Kisses on the Bottom in 2012, I think it was, if he had taken one of the images from these sessions of him and Linda or whatever and put that on Kisses on the Bottom, I think it would have looked fantastic. But that's just me, whatever. All right, so me back in 1986 when this first came out, okay, I'm the boomer, all right? Baby boomer, whatever you want to call me, born in the early 60s, okay? I was one year married in 1986, you know, happily married in my mid-20s. I was so into Paul at that time. Anything Paul put out, I was into it. I mean, you know, Tug of War came out right on it. Day it came out. Pipes of Peace came out. I'm right on it. Give my regards to Broad Street, right on it. Matter of fact, funny story I've told before is when the movie came out, I dragged my young wife at the time, only being, uh, well, no, I'm sorry, at the time we were engaged, I dragged my fiance at the time in 1984 out to the theater an hour and a half early. It was being played at a theater in a mall. And I said, hun, we got to go early because it's Paul McCartney, a Beatle. It's his first movie. It's going to be, it's going to be like Hard Day's Night. It's going to be a sellout. There's going to be a line around the block and all that stuff. And the funny part was we got there, bought the tickets to go in the theater. There was no line. And then she said, oh, I have to go to the ladies room. I'll be right back. I went into the theater and her funny memory, she still busts my chops over today, is that when she finally got into the theater after leaving the ladies room, she walked in the theater and all she saw was the back of my head in the middle of the theater and no other human beings around. Okay, so that's the funny story about giving my regards to Broad Street. But anyway, I was so into Paul, I had to be there early. You know, I, the line was going to be so, whatever. Okay, I, yeah, I was a nut, folks. I st still am on some level. Anyway, I thought it was great when this first came out. Press to Play came out. I liked just about all, all 10 tracks I loved. Okay, the only two I was a little sketchy on, when I say sketchy, I didn't dislike them, I was just like, eh, was Talk More Talk and Pretty Little Head. The other eight, I loved them. I thought they were great at the time. Now, the thing I really loved, though, was the CD. This was the first Paul album where I bought all three formats. I bought the vinyl, I bought the CD, because CDs were the new medium at the time in 1986, and I bought the cassette. And on the cassette... And on the CD, you got three extra songs. And I loved all three of them. Right away, It's Not True, and Tough on a Tightrope. You had, you know, when I, I just was so into the CD because I liked, like I said, eight out of the ten original tracks I, I really liked. And the other two were like, eh. But then those three bonus that you got on the CD, loved them. I thought they were great little pop songs. And so this album on CD or cassette for me was fantastic, you know. But then something happened to me. In the late 90s, you know, his music styles and things changed, and Paul had new releases by then, the late 90s. Um, I kind of went off this album a little bit. There was a period of years from the late 90s into the 2000s where I was not into Press to Play. I just kind of shelved it, didn't really like it. And <clears throat> as a matter of fact, it even kind of ranked towards the bottom of my Paul albums at one point. Uh, right around the time, I, was, I remember getting into YouTube around 2016, 2017 or so, I was ranking this one pretty low. Um, I don't know what it was. I just got off it a little bit. But in the last eight to 10 years or so, it started to grow again on me. And it has come on strong again. And I do enjoy it now, especially with those three bonus tracks. But even the 10 track album itself, I do enjoy it. I do put it on on occasion and I do like it for what it is albeit the 80s production and all that, but it's it's a product of its time. And I do like the song quality, though. I think Paul wrote, wrote some great songs on here. So I'm back to kind of liking this album again. But now, as I change my Matt Street glasses into my old man glasses so I can read these for you, I have my Millennial and I have my Gen Z's reports. And they wrote me some good ones, folks. And you're going to be surprised at these folks because... I enjoy press now because I think a lot of you, after I did episode one of uh, Truth, you, some of you slammed me a little bit and said, oh, hey, Matt, you're, you know, you're putting down Paul and all that. And, and I'm not. Egypt Station just happened to be the first one that I'm a little bit, eh, it's okay. And the millennial and Gen Z didn't like Egypt Station. But this one, you're going to see a difference, okay? Because I do enjoy it now. So here's my millennial, born in the 80s. And my millennial says, reports back to me after listening to it, Listened to Press to Play while I was working out this morning, and I have to admit, I thought it was really cool. 
Stranglehold is a rocking opener that sounds a little like Shaken Stevens in the beginning. Good Times Coming has a nice little hook, followed by an even better hook on Feel the Sun, which could be a nice song on its own. Talk More Talk was different, but I thought it was interesting. I would like to give it another listen. Footprints was a nice slice of life, sort of melancholy ballad in the vein of Paul's classics like Fool on the Hill for No One, parentheses, although not quite on that level musically, parentheses. Only Love Remains was okay, again, reminded me of some of his soaring Beatles ballads without quite hitting the mark. Press is a fun 80s pop song. I can see why it was the single. Didn't really like Pretty Little Head, kind of weird. Felt out of place on this album. I really liked Move Over Busker, toe-tapping song with very cool lyrics. Liked the new wave post-punk sound and attitude on Angry. Loved However Absurd, vulner Vulnerable Ballad with creative lyrics. Loved how it closed with a mix of horns and synthesizer, a fitting close to a nice album. First impression was really good. I will probably go back to it. That's from my millennial on Press to Play. Now my Gen Z, born in the 90s. Let's get the obvious out of the way. It sounds like Paul got a synth and a sampler for Christmas that year, ha ha. But at the core, most of the songs are pretty good. Strong opener with Stranglehold, parentheses, hit well as the first song on a drive, parentheses. Has this weird rockabilly 80s vibe. I won't lie, my first thought with Good Times was, oh no, I had enough reggae Paul with the bridge of Live and Let Die, but it won me over right at the chorus when he added a few more elements sonically. It rolled into Talk More Talk nicely. That one was fun. I could see myself throwing it on a summer Yacht Rock 80s playlist. Footprints was fine, but nothing I'd write home about and actually found me skipping to the next one about a minute or so to go, which I'm glad I did because I think Only Love Remains is one of the stronger tracks on the album. To me, it was the most Beatlesque in the sense as this sounded like something the Beatles would do if they had stayed together and succumbed to 80s production and sound. Press was solid, upbeat, fun, and I agree with others that you can hear why it was the single, Solid Hooks. Pretty Little Head was a tad indulgent and probably should have been cut off the album. Move Over Busker is probably my in my top two or three on the album. I think I like it because we finally have a little harder guitar on this track, and Paul rocks a bit more on this. I particularly like the bridge on that one. Angry is when Rocking Paul succumbs to Weirdo Paul. It had potential, but his delivery is a tad too goofy for me. But he saved it with ending on However Absurd, another track I would dub Beatlesque, which quite a few are on this album, to be honest. So, overall, this album was a solid listen. The track sequencing, sequencing made it an easy one to just listen to from start to finish. Even with the meh track sprinkled in, I think this goes to show what happens when Paul appears to give a shit about his lyrics. Egypt Station might have had interesting musical compositions, but with half-baked lyrics, it fell short. My current review rankings are pretty obvious. Number one right now is Press to Play. Number two, Egypt Station. Side note from my Gen Z. The cover is awful. Gives me a sappy 80s love ballad vibe and doesn't give me any vibes found in the music. So there you have it, folks, from my Gen Z and my millennial and my little take on it. I think Press to Play did pretty good on the Matthew Street, Paul McCartney, The Truth series. What do you think? I'm out of here now, and hopefully they'll be coming back soon. We have some other great Paul albums planned for Episode 2 and Episode 3, so I hope you'll stick around for that. And thank you again. Love you all.